Welcome to my lecture recital. I will uh, perform the Mozart D minor concerto in its entirety first, and then I'll go through the lecture. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture recital. I would like to start by thanking Professor James Tocco for his continued support during my studies at CCM, and in particular for the preparation of this recital. I would also like to thank Professor Jennifer Doctor, who corrected my proposal and provided me with access to various research tools and methods. Finally, I would like to thank my parents for their support during my studies in the US. My lecture recital is entitled, Hummel after Mozart, Hummel's transcriptions of Mozart's piano concerto in D minor, Gehel 466. In this lecture, I am going to analyze the historical context around the writing of this transcription. I will discuss, discuss the piano culture at the turn of the 19th century, the transcription culture, and a brief overview of Hummel's biography and its connections with the transcriptions of Mozart's concerto in D minor. Then I will discuss the issue of the incomplete and fragmentary notation in Mozart piano concertos. Finally, I will compare the Mozart original and the Hummel transcription of the concerto. This comparison will reveal the deviations, additions, and ornamentations that Hummel provided in the transcription compared to the original score. There are two key factors pertaining the piano culture at the beginning of the 19th century. The first one is the emergence of the middle class, the second, the technological development of the piano. The Industrial Revolution started in England at the end of the 18th century, brought technical innovations that allowed mass production, production of goods and propitiated an era of newfound prosperity for merchants and industrialists, which saw the rise of a prosperous middle class for the first time in Europe. This middle class, able not only to afford musical instruments in the home, but also willing to spend leisure time studying and playing music, perform a fundamental role in the emergence of new music genres like the piano transcription, created for the purpose of making symphonic works available to both middle class audiences and musical amateurs. At the same time, the piano became an intensely public instrument. Its growth coincided with the growth of the bourgeois public to the point that by the beginning of the 19th century, it was the only instrument that was regularly played alone before an audience. The popularity of the instrument supported the emergence of a new type of musician, the International Concert Virtuoso. The first wave of virtuosi from 1780 to 1820 came mainly from two centers of pianistic activity, London and Vienna. The most notable participants were Muzio Clementi, Johann Baptist Kramer, Jan Ladislav Duszek, John Field, 
Ignaz Moscheles, and Johann Nepomuk Humo. The ascendance of the virtuoso can be explained by the rising importance of the bourgeois audiences to which they cater. The virtuosi, freed from the demands of noble or churchly patrons for more varied musical genres, could now specialize in performing and creating music almost exclusively for the piano. With specialization came advancements in piano technique, consisting in novel figurations played at unheard of speed and an exploitation of the entire range of the keyboard. These advancements would have not been possible without the improvements in piano construction that were happening at the same time. Hummel's decision to transcribe Mozart's music is directly related to the emergence and propagation of the piano, which occurred in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The piano in 1770 was a transitional instrument, not yet fully mature. It was through the efforts of many manufacturers that its full possibilities were realized. Thanks to these technological advancements, the piano became a popular instrument for amateur players of the Warrior C and transcriptions for chamber ensemble or for piano solo, such as Hummel transcriptions of Mozart symphonies and concerti became very popular with amateur players. The transcription or arrangement was the primary medium for the dissemination and reproduction of concert repertoire. It assumed a role that would be played by the radio and phonograph in the 20th century. The transcription gave amateurs an opportunity to hear in their own home a wide variety of symphonic, chamber, and choral works beyond what they might have access to in live performance. Transcriptions serve a variety of purposes. Besides entertainment, they also became a tool for musical literacy and the education of professional musicians. Playing an arrangement before attending a concert allowed a musician to better appreciate the music when heard played by an orchestra. There were clear economic motivations, economical motivations behind the proliferation of the transcription genre. As mentioned before, there was a huge demand for arrangements and therefore many composers, music teachers, conductors, and musicologists made a living at one time or another by, by transcribing the works of others. By some transcriptions, but some transcriptions also had real artistic incentives behind them and I believe that the Hummel transcription fit both categories. Regarding the genesis of Hummel's Mozart transcriptions, there are two key biographical facts in Hummel's life that are relevant for the present study. The first one is the time he spent studying with Mozart. The second is his relationship with the publisher, J.R. Schultz. Hummel spent approximately two years living and studying with Mozart, from 1786 or 1787 until December 1788. This was one of the most productive periods in Mozart's life, in which several of his most important works were being composed or performed. This included the operas Le Nozze di Figaro and Don Giovanni, the string quintets Kehel 515 and 516, Eine kleine Nach Music, Kehel 521, and the piano concerto in D major, Kehel 537, Coronation. The tutelage under Mozart was not structured in a conventional manner, it was more a process of osmosis than regular lessons. His instructions involving, involved playing Mozart's piano music, playing four hands with him, composing, and experiencing the frenetic musical activity that went on in Mozart's house at a time when he was composing these masterpieces. Mozart's unconventional and chaotic lifestyle also applied to his teaching, and it is well documented that he used to give instructions while playing billiards or bowls. Hummel also had the opportunity to meet several notable people that visited the Mozart's house, such as Joseph Haydn and the libertist Lorenzo La Ponte. Undoubtedly, the time spent with Mozart had an immense influence on Hummel's style and development, which he proudly acknowledged throughout his life. He continued to devote attention to Mozart's music after his years of apprenticeship, performing it either as a pianist or a conductor. Many years after his studies with Mozart and when he was already an established composer and performer, Hummel entered the acquaintance of the publisher J.R. Schultz of London, which provided him with the incentive for arranging a number of Mozart's compositions. Schultz commissioned the arrangements in 1821. Hummel was one of the best options for the job since he was the most famous Mozart student and heard him play on numerous occasions. He also performed and conducted many of the pieces that he was going to arrange. 
The arrangements were created for piano, flute, violin, and cello. Among the works arranged by Hummel are the overtures to the operas Di Sauber Flotte, Don Giovanni, La Clemenza di Tito, and Le Nozze di Figaro. The symphony is scheduled 385, 425, 504, 543, 550, and 551. And the piano concerto is scheduled 316A, 456, 466, 482, 491, 503, and 537. The arrangement of the piano concerto are, are especially interesting. As Hummel scholar Mark Kroll points out, they are particularly valuable since they shed light on a number of performance practices from the early 19th century. For example, Schultz asked Hummel to add ornamentations and new cadenzas to the originals and to change some harmonies with the view of catering to the taste of the current market. We therefore learn from this arrangement how the music of Mozart and other 18th century composers was being performed in the 1820s. The arrangement proved to be pop popular and commercially successful for both, both Hummel and the publisher. Regarding the issue of the incomplete and fragmentary notation in Mozart piano concertos, it is known that Mozart did not take part in any pub publishing process except for six concertos. Most of the editorial work was done posthumously, initiated by the interests and economical needs of his widow Constance and of several publishers. Therefore, the only sources available to the publishers were the manuscripts used by the composer during his performances. This circumstance led to the scores being deficient in several respects. Besides lacking articulation and interpretative marks, they exhibit several issues regarding the completeness and unambiguity of the piano part. Mozart usually was in a rush to prepare the scores for a performance. Therefore, he would often enter the stage with nothing but a sketch of the piano part, which he, being the soloist, would complete during the performance. Additionally, Mozart's practice of improvisation is well documented in letters and other contemporary documents. For these reasons, completing Mozart's score becomes a necessity for performers looking to be faithful to the spirit of the composer's performance practice. According to Leonardo Miucci, editor of the latest scholarly edition of Hummel's transcription of Mozart's D minor concerto, Hummel transcriptions are a valuable model for this practice. Since Hummel's interest in and deep knowledge of his teacher works for fortepiano and orchestra is attested by numerous accounts. Apart from witnessing the birth of several of the masterpieces of those years, Hummel must himself have studied these pieces on more than one occasion with his teacher, giving public performances of them in his presence. Going into the transcription itself, although it was written for piano, flute, violin, and cello, there is a strong case for performing it for piano solo. Hummel certainly envisioned the possibility that his arrangement can be used either as a piano solo or quartet version due to the fact that the piano part is in itself complete. This idea is supported by historical documents, such as letters between the publisher and Hummel, and the front page of the first English edition, shown in example one, which states that the arrangement is for the pianoforte and accompaniments of flute, violin, and violoncello. In fact, this transcription can be considered an arrangement for three amateur players and a considerably skilled pianist. The publisher Schultz commissioned Hummel to write 12 arrangements of Mozart's piano concerto. Additionally, he commissioned the composers and pianists Ignaz Moscheles and Friedrich Kalbrenner to write two each. In a letter between Moscheles and Hummel, Moscheles described the project to Hummel and offered suggestions for arranging Mozart's original. He writes, Her Schultz project, to bring out a selection of Mozart concertos with enriched solo reinforcements, especially in the close, closing passage work, seems of special interest to me. If you undertake this enterprise, you cannot fail to succeed. Would you kindly just explain the following points further? further. Number one, if in the tutis and the obligato parts, the accompaniment ought not to be written out for the piano in small notes, as in your concerto. Two, if occasionally due to the increased brilliance, a few measures could not be added to the principal passages. Three, if it would not be better to retain the designation concerto, not sonata. 
Or would you please indicate which, con which concertos you will arrange? Because Herr Kalbrenner and I would let gladly attach ourselves to this work and then choose. Of these suggestions, there are two procedures that Hummel adopts for the arrangement of the concerto. Number one, he reinforces the solo piano part in general, often using fuller chords and including parts of the orchestra in the solo. And he also provides rich ornamentation and cadences. Number two, he recomposes the closing passages of the solo sections before the orchestral tutti, using the full range of the 1820s pianos that went beyond the range of Mozart's instrument. Contrary to Mozart's suggestions, he is very respectful and does not add measures to Mozart's original, but instead chooses to cut some material. I will illustrate some of these changes. The first striking deviation from Mozart's original is at the beginning of the initial orchestral tutti. Mozart's original uses syncopation to present the first motive in the strings. This, this feature adds urgency to the music and contributes to the agitated effects. Uh, you can see this in example two of the hand. This is Mozart's version. material on the beat rather than syncopated. The syncopation is offered by the violin line in the transcription, the quartet version. Um, this is an effect that is lost when played as a solo piano transcription. This is Hummel's version. In example three, there is one notable structural change, a five bar cut in the orchestral exposition. Bars 53 to 57 are cut, this being a repetition of bars 48 to 52, as they appear in the transcription. Again, in example 3, this is Mozart's version. In example four, at the end of the first solo, there is an example of recomposition of the piano part that goes beyond the range of Mozart's piano. This modification undoubtedly adds brilliance to the closing of the solo and makes the entrance of the tutti more dramatic. This is the Mozart original. And this is a uh, Hummel transcription. Uh, please note that he also adds part of the orchestra in the left hand. Another instance of octa octave transfer at a closing section occurs right before the second theme, shown in example five. This is Mozart's original. And this is Hummel's transcription. In example six, uh, an interesting integration of orchestral and solo parts occur occurs in the second theme. Hummel integrates the line of the oboe and bassoon in the piano part. It is important to keep the same articulation that a bassoon would do in the left. I will play Hummel's version. Example 7, still in the second theme, note how Hummel increases the brilliancy of the passage work. This is Mozart's version. And this is Hummel. The development 
is uh, left mostly untouched, except for a few parts in which Hummel includes orchestral lines in the left hand of the piano part, like this. In the recapitulation, the same closing sections that were modified in the exposition are also enhanced. Please see example A. This is Mozart's original. The same procedure is applied to the corresponding closing section of the second theme in the recapitulation. Again, this is Mozart's version. And this is Hummel's version. Cadenza is especially noteworthy. Hummel uses two main motives to construct this cadenza, the second theme in the piano exposition and a figuration from the first theme. The second theme is developed extensively in major and minor tonalities. The second theme is juxtaposed to the figuration of the first theme, which is also modulatory and virtuosic. This in turn leads to some highly dramatic diminished arpeggios and a return to the second theme in the key of the minor punctuated by a trill in the right. The cadenza is concluded by a sustained trill and a chromatic figuration in the left hand, followed by a double trill and a return to the orchestral ritornello. I think it is a shame that this cadenza is not often used. People instead choose invariably the one written by Beethoven. I would encourage pianists to use this very interesting cadenza. The second movement is remarkable for the copious ornamentation that Hummel introduces. Here is a characteristic passage that shows the extent to which Hummel ornamented Mozart's line. In example 10, the lower two staves are Mozart's original, the upper one is Hummel variants. I will play the Mozart original first, then Hummel variants. <laughs> In example 11, there is a especially remarkable ornamentation passage in Hummel's transcription. This passage has an irregular rhythmic distribution, 23 against 4, no doubt foreshadowing Chopin's style of ornamentation. The middle section in G minor is left mostly untouched, but it is interesting to note that Hummel decided not to repeat the second half of the section. The return of the first theme is again profusely ornamented. Most of the ornaments are at the ending of phrases, such, such as example 12. This is Mozart's original.
Hummel more Hummel's more ornamented version is like this. The ending of the movement is much simpler in Mozart's version. Uh, please see example 13. This is Mozart. Compared to what Hummel writes. continues Hummel's customary practice of enhancing the solos, especially at the ending of phrases. However, his variants are much less conspicuous than in the first and second movement, no doubt because the Mozart original is already virtuosic enough. As an example, let's compare the two versions of the B theme of the rondo. Please see example 14. This is Mozart's version. Before the return of the refrain, Hummel provides an Einheit, a short improvisatory passage uh, before the statement of, them of them thematic material. You can see it in example 15. It is curious that some pianists choose not to perform uh, an eingang in this place. I don't know if because they don't know that you know, you're supposed to play an eingang there. The Neue Mozart Ausgabe, the edition, the Baden Writer edition, says explicitly that you have to play an eingang in this spot. In the recapitulation, Hummel provides men, minor variants that make the solo slightly more difficult. This is Mozart's version. that Hummel provides is based on two motives from the movement, the initial mind and rocket and the motive from the first solo after the orchestral two. These motives are later complemented by virtuosic elaborations of passage work from the B section of the run. Again, the cadenza ends in a double trip. The last section of the rondo follows closely Mozart's version. In the arpeggios of the closing section, Hummel chooses to extend the arpeggios to two octaves in the second time they appear for increased virtuosity. This is an example 17. The work ends brilliantly, and of course, Hummel combines the piano solo and orchestral parts to bring the work to a sonorous close. As a way to conclude this lecture, I would like to offer some scholarly opinions about Hummel's arrangements. Scholars on Mozart's keyboard music, such, such as Frederick Neumann and Eva and Paul Badura Skoda, show objections to Hummel's arrangements. Neumann and Badura Skoda criticize Hummel's embellishments for being too lavish. Badura Skoda claims that Hummel embellished Mozart works much too elaborately and that Hummel embellishments are not in the style of Mozart. I partially agree with these objections. Hummel was writing for an early 19th century audience and for an instrument 
that went beyond what Mozart had, both in ter terms of power and range. However, these arrangements are undoubtedly valuable for several reasons. First, they allow a performance of these great works with a reduced number of musicians, suitable for a chamber or solo recital without requiring an entire orchestra. Second, they come from a musician that was educated directly by Mozart and who undoubtedly studied these pieces under his tutelage. Finally, they offer an intriguing model of ornamentation for Mozart's music, and it is a solid starting point from which pianists can create their own ornamentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>